Well, in Genesis 1 and 1, it reads, In the beginning God, we're going to read the entire Bible tonight. <laughs> and we're going to do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Now, if we were at it all in the Amplified Version, we couldn't do that, but we'll just stick to the New King James so we can get it done. <laughs> Debbie loves the Amplified. Yep. Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning, God. What a great way to start the Bible. What a great way to start anything. Everybody say, say it with me one time. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Created the heavens and the earth. Then in John 1 and verses 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. We've been uh, teaching a series, this is really the second week in a series of the great doctrines of our faith. Uh, last week we talked about the divinity of Christ, tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Trinity. Everybody say the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Yeah. And uh, it's very interesting that when you start reading the Bible, it, right out of the very starting gates of our study in the Word, it starts with, in the beginning, God. The Bible does not seek to explain the existence of God. It just assumes that everybody knows that God exists. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. In fact, if you look at uh, polling data in this country... Uh, over 90% of the folks from the 40s on through believe that there is a God. Now, sometimes they define it all sorts of different ways. And in most recent years, I've heard that those in the age of uh, 30 and below, I believe, are becoming increasingly uh, disassociated with churches. Uh, but nonetheless, if you ask folks, uh, do you believe that there is a God, over 90%, I think it's like 92% as of May in 2011, says, yes, we believe there is a God. And it's fluctuated from 92 to 98 and, and so forth. And so pretty much everybody believes that there is a God. So say it with me. I believe, I believe. in the Lord God, the Lord God. Almighty. Yeah, so it doesn't attempt to prove the existence of God. It just starts out with the revelation that uh, God is God. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? That's right. But it does go on to explain the nature of God. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. God is very interested in revealing His nature. And over the period of Scripture, from Old Testament to New Testament, you get this unfolding, beautiful revelation of who God is, what God's purposes are, uh, the very nature of God. Someone has described it before as looking at the multifacets of a diamond. As you turn a diamond and with, with every little turn, there's a different flash of brilliance uh, as the light plays off the many uh, facets of the diamond. Well, that's like reading Scripture. Every time you turn the page, there's another flash of revelation or flash of glory as you get an understanding of who God is. In fact, in, in glory, we've seen into glory through Scripture, it says that the, uh, the holy uh, angels are crying, holy, 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 about the throne of God. That's what they do all day long. That's what they do all eternity long. Why? Because every time they get a new revelation of how wondrous He is, how glorious He is, and, and all they can do is just cry, holy, holy, holy. I'm looking for the day when we're up there, praise God, and we're seeing Him for all the splendor that He is. Glory! Hallelujah. So Scripture does reveal the nature of God, the will of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, and I'm very, I'm very glad about that. Now, last week we talked about the divine nature of Jesus Christ. And we, very quickly, just in review, we looked at parallel passages between the Old Testament and New Testament, where in the Old Testament there was direct references to uh, the person of God, a Jehovah God, Yahweh God. And in the New Testament, the exact same wording of a parallel passage, but this time it's in reference to Jesus Christ. We talked about such things as John the Baptist uh, would come in, in the like spirit of Elijah. He would come to proclaim and make the way of, uh, for Jehovah. 
Well, in the New Testament, John the Baptist came and made the way for Jesus Christ. And so there's many endless scriptures of that nature. We looked in scripture and we saw that the witnesses, those were those who were the contemporaries of Christ, called him God. In fact, his enemies realized that Jesus was calling and making himself God because they said he's blaspheming. He's making himself as God. In fact, that was the reason that they used to crucify him, that he proclaims himself to be God. In fact, Jesus declared that he was God when he used the titles of God. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He used the I am name of God. He received worship as God. When other people called him God, he did not correct them. And so it, it all boils down to this, that if Jesus is not God, then the gospel does not work because we do not have God becoming man and being the sinless sacrifice for a fallen human race. And if you want more explanation on that, watch last week's message. That's all the review you're going to get. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's all your, the review you're going to get. Praise the Lord. Now turn with me to James. James chapter 1 verse 17. And we have got to make some ground up here, kids. So go ahead and put on your seatbelts now because we're going to start moving. James chapter 1 verse 17. Um, if we're going to talk about the nature of God, there must be absolute agreement between the Old Testament and the New Testament as to who God is. Uh, you can't have a, a, the nature of God in the Old Testament disagreeing with the nature of God in the New Testament. James 1 and 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The God of the Old Testament has to be the same God of the New Testament. The nature of God in the New Testament has to be revealed as the nature of God in the Old Testament. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, very quickly. Now, when God began to reveal himself in the Old Testament, he did it uh, through uh, picking a man, then picking a nation. And it was in the midst of a very polytheistic world. Uh, every nation had multiple gods. They had the god of the harvest. They had a god of fertility. They had a god of weather. They had a god of this, a god of that. They had all sorts of god, endless amounts of god of all these pagan nations that surrounded the Hebrews. But God began to reveal himself to Abraham and on down through the line, and especially then to Moses, I am that I am. He revealed himself as a monarch theistic God, a singular God. And it's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so now we have a monotheistic revelation of who God is. There's no more uh, pluralism or, I mean, polytheism. There is a monotheistic or a singular God. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Now, this is repeated again. And just write, make note of this in, in your notes. We won't, won't turn to it. But Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, God says, I'm the first, I'm the last. Besides me, there is no God. And then in verse 8, he says, is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And then Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6, I'm the Lord, there is no other. There is no God besides me, says the Lord. Verse 6, he says, I am the Lord. There is no other. And then when you go to the New Testament, you know, the Old Testament has to agree with the New and vice versa. You see the same uh, revelation, the oneness of God. In 1 Timothy 2 and 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully man, fully God. And then in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6, it says, Therefore, uh, you'll want to turn to this one, Therefore, concerning the things, the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is no other God but one. Verse 5, 
For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods, little g, and many lords, little l, verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. If you look in Scripture, you'll see at least 50 other passages that reference uh, the monotheistic revelation of God, that there is one God. But this is what we have to ask ourselves. What does one mean? What does it mean, one God? What is the essence of God? What is the nature of God? Does the divine unity allow for the idea of plurality of persons forming a single Godhead? And that's the big question. And the answer is yes. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say yes. Yeah. Does the divine unity allow for the idea of plurality of personalities forming a single Godhead. Now, this is something that's been debated on down the line. If you look in the second century, there was a, a group that arose in the church, and they believed that Jesus was not divine, that uh, the Holy Spirit was not divine, that there was a, a, a single Father God, and Jesus was not God the Son, and the Holy Spirit was not God the Holy Spirit and so there was a great debate within the church about that and then there were some that believed that Jesus is divine but he is a just another revelation of the Father as is the Holy Spirit and so the, really there is one God in three different disguises as it were in three different uh, three different functions but but they're all the same oneness and this debate within the church uh, really started upsetting the apple cart so that in the third in the fourth century in 325 AD they called a council together and they just debated the issue they said is Jesus divine and in that council there's some that debated against the divinity of Christ there's some that debated for the divinity of Christ and everybody agreed that Jesus was divine Praise the Lord. They settled it up. But then they had to have additional councils. In fact, they had two more in uh, 351 and in 381. And they finally decided, uh, as Scripture revealed to them, that there is a Godhead, a holy trinity. God the Father is a person. And, and the reason we say that he's a person is because he has personality. He, he has personality. He has things he likes. He has things he doesn't like. Jesus Christ is a person in that he has a personality. Uh, you know, personal pronouns are used in regards to them. He has things he likes, things he doesn't like. The Holy Spirit is a person, a person of God, in that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. He has a will. He has uh, emotions. Are y'all following me with this? So by the last council, they had decided that Jesus is divine and that Scripture reveals there is a Godhead, a holy trinity supported in Scripture. And that has been the prevailing thought in, uh, in the church world since that time, really since the first century, but it just had to be ironed out, had to be nailed down. Everybody had to come into agreement. Now, those same thoughts still prevail today. There are... Are, uh, other uh, belief systems that do not believe Jesus is divine. There are other belief systems that believe that in the unity of God, but not in the Trinity of God, and that still exists today. But the predominant, the overwhelming, the the doctrine that is embraced by uh, the vast majority of the body of Christ is the idea of the Godhead being the Holy Trinity: God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, there is a confession that is called the Westminster Confession, and it was adopted in 1646, and uh, basically most everybody goes by this. It says, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. And that word begotten, don't let it throw you up, doesn't throw you off. 
It doesn't mean that, that Jesus was born at, at uh, some time in eternity past. Of course, we knew he was, he was born of the Virgin Mary. But it doesn't mean that God the Son was born. No, it just means that word begotten means that he is unique in nature. He is uniquely the Son of God, okay? And the Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. All right. Let's look at the Old, Old Testament just for a second. Say, I, I'm with you, Pastor. All right. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament hints at the idea of Trinity. Now, you have to understand that in the Old Testament, it is full of type and shadow. It, it doesn't declare everything outright. In fact, it doesn't declare uh, that the church is going to come to an, into existence. It doesn't declare uh, the age of grace, which we are living in now. It doesn't declare the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Though it implies and it refers to, it doesn't make just real clear declarations about it. So you have to look through all of the scriptures. You have to compare things. You have to lay things next to each other and get the revelation as God is unfolding it over a course of thousands of years through prophetic utterance okay so back to Deuteronomy 6 and 4 it reads hear O Israel the Lord our God is uh, the Lord our God the Lord is one that literally should read hear O Israel Jehovah our Elohim is one Jehovah it switches the use of the name of God there's various names of God in Scripture and the one Jehovah is the covenant name of God, but Elohim is a very interesting word. It's also uh, the same uh, as with the word Adonai for Lord. It is a plural use of God. That is our first revelation that, oh, there's more to God than what we thought. There, God, in fact, the most dominant use of the word God is Elohim. It's all through, uh, all through creation, all through the Old Testament. It's Elohim, a plural revelation of the person of God. Now, some would say that that is just a plural uh, uh, revelation because he is so grand and he is so glorious that he, he uh, deserves the utterance of God more and more. But when you look at it, you see that in creation, God used that plural uh, also with plural pronouns. And we'll look at that in just a second in Genesis 1 and 26. And in fact, you can turn to that right now. Genesis 1 and 26. Because it reads, Then God, Elohim, the plural use of God, said, Let us make man in our... Everybody say that. Our image. Let us make man in our... Who is God talking to? Some would say that he's talking to a council of angels. Uh, that he draws angels together and the singular God refers to this company of angels around, around him as he's getting ready to make this wonderful creation. But he's saying, let us make man in our image. Man was not made in the image of angels. Made in the image of God. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so you see very clearly that there is more to this revelation of God that, yes, he's monotheistic. He is a singular God. He is a, but he is a God of unity, and there is a plurality of his person. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right. In Isaiah 6 and 8, the, the, another example of the plurality use of God. Isaiah 6 and 8, it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Genesis 3 and 22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Everybody say us. us. Amen. When, when you're talking about 
the singular revelation of God in the original language, it talks about this compound unity in the original language. It's not talking about one particular God or person. It's talking about a compound unity. The phrasing of the language uh, is, is kind of like, for example, when it says, uh, man shall leave his, his uh, father and mother and he shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one there's a compound unity well Debbie and I are one in the strictest sense of the word yet we're very much individual there's there's two of us you understand that and so in the nature of God there's a compound unity but the essence of God is exactly the same you can't separate father from son from Holy Spirit they have exactly the same essence in their person now if you look at the active uh, operation of creation in Genesis 1, are you still in Genesis 1? You, you should be. Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God, God created heavens and the earth. <laughs> are you rushing back there? Well, it's too late. I'm, I'm already passing it. I'm already from, okay, in the beginning God created heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. So God created, but now look, look who's entering the scene. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So you have God the Father, but then you have the Spirit of God there just as well. But then we know from John 1, speaking of Jesus, all things were made through Him. John 1 and 3. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And so you have a revelation of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in this process of creation. And there's many, many more things that we could talk about. We could talk about pre-incarnate appearances of Christ where he's called the angel of God or the messenger of God where he, he appears and as the captain of the host or he appears... Uh, to, um, to Hagar or, or whoever, all these, uh, these pre-incarnate appearances. And scholars agree that that is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And yet he is called Jehovah by the people who are talking to him. And so you see the son being sent by the father in this pre-incarnate uh, appearance and people referring to him as Jehovah. So there, there's all sorts of those. Now, for sake of time, let's quickly go to the New Testament. And so I can close this up real quick. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Is this helping anybody? Yes. All right. Now, in the New Testament, the New Testament just declares the Trinity. The Old Testament hints at the Trinity. The New Testament is very bold in its declaration of the Trinity. In fact, there are multiple examples where the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are in the same place at the same time time. First of all, the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And when he, Jesus, had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God. Now, he's in the water. The heavens, the Spirit of God, is descending down. The Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So there, there's two. Jesus is here. The Spirit of God is descending down. They're not the same one. There's, there's, in a bodily form, he's coming down. Jesus has a body. He has a body. Holy Spirit coming down. And then suddenly, in verse 17, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so you get this perfect picture of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all involved in this baptism of Jesus Christ. So unless Jesus is throwing his voice like a ventriloquist or, or something weird is going on, so you get that perfect picture. And then you get it again at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 6. Don't turn there. But again, the same thing happened. A bright cloud enveloped Jesus. A voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son whom, in whom I am well pleased hear him and then very interestingly in Revelation chapter 5 verses 6 and 7 when when John got the revelation of heaven he says I looked and behold in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb now who's the lamb of God John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. A lamb as though it had been slain. 
having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Verse 7, And this lamb, and he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Where did Jesus get the scroll from? Somebody sitting on the throne. Who was that? The Father. That's right. So God, the revelation of God, two persons of God in the same place at the same time. And then in Matthew 26, there's another revelation of Jesus being seated on the right hand of the Father. Matthew 26 and 64, Jesus told his persecutors, you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, say, says the same thing, that Jesus sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In fact, when Stephen was being stoned to death, the deacon Stephen being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, he said, being full of the Holy Ghost, he, he gazed up into heaven as he was dying, and he said, I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so there's all these scriptural revelations of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in the same place at the same time, but distinguished clearly as three distinct persons. You got it? All right. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ referred to the Father and the Holy Spirit as separate persons from himself in John chapter 14 when he said, I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And then down in verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So Jesus was talking about the Father. He says, I'm going to pray to the Father. Was Jesus praying to himself? No, he was praying to the Father. What was he asking the Father? Send someone different than me. Another helper, another comforter, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was making reference that there is a Father different from him. There's a Holy Spirit different from him. But they all work together. Someone say, praise the Lord. And, and when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he, he lifted up his eyes in, in John eleven forty one, 41. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said that, that they may believe that you sent me. Who was Jesus talking to? What did he want them to believe? He wanted them to believe that someone had sent him to raise Lazarus from the dead. Come on, say amen. amen. So we, we just have to ask the question. If, if Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are a single person, one that operates with different disguises, why did Jesus go through all of this to make us believe that there are three different persons of the Godhead? Why would he do that? Well, because it's the truth. There are three different persons of the Godhead. Turn to your neighbor and say, praise God. Praise, praise God. God. I'll just close with this. When you look at the benedictions of Paul, he distinguished all three in 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. When you look at the baptismal formula, there is a triunity expressed there in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When you look at Jude, he distinguishes all three. In his writings, Jude 20 and 21, Peter's salutation distinguished all three. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. And then Paul emphasizes the triunity of the Godhead in Ephesians 4. And I'm closing on this verse. Ephesians 4 verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Praise the Lord. Did that help anybody tonight? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.